This is Hawk and Carlton here at Carlton Carnivores, and today we're going to uh, give you a little rundown on one of the smaller species of snakes that I am taking care of right now. These are the Cape or African house snakes, uh, Boadon capensis. Now, this is Carmel. She is a young adult female Cape house snake. There are several different species of snakes in Africa that are referred to as house snakes, and uh, they have quite a tumultuous uh, taxonomic history behind them. So these guys were once uh, classified as Lamprophis uh, fuliginosus, back before it was discovered uh, through genetics and uh, morphological studies. These guys are actually separate from fuliginosus, so they were separated into a new species, Capensis which is found across um, southern and eastern Africa in several various different habitats. They can be found from desert to uh, savannas, grasslands, forests, just about anywhere where they can find a good food source. So once they were separated from uh, fuliginosis, uh, more genetic studies ended up showing that these guys, uh, they were uh, placed in the colubrid family, colubridae. So a lot of people still think that they're in that family, but in fact, uh, it's been found that they're actually genetically closer related to the elapids, so like the cobras, the crates, uh, the sea snakes. So they were actually moved into their own separate family, the lamprophidae. And when that happened, a lot of the house snake species like uh, Fuliginosis, the brown house snake, and these guys, the cape house snake, were actually moved into a separate uh, genus, uh, Boadon. Now there's a, still a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the different species in that genus, and it's not helped at all by the fact that a lot of these animals have been uh, crossed in uh, captivity, so you'll find a lot of Fuliginosis, uh, Lineatus, Capensis hybrids and uh, back cross lineages because some of those other species have actually been where we get the origins for some of the different color forms, different mutations that we see in these guys. So in the wild these guys will eat just about anything that's small enough for them to get a hold of. So uh, rodents are a particular favorite, small rats and mice, uh, they love lizards, uh, when they get bigger, especially the females, they'll eat uh, small birds sometimes, just about anything that they can get a hold of. So a unique thing about these guys actually is uh, what is referred to as sexual dimorphism. In some species that refers to differences in color or patterning. In the case of the house snakes though, it's primarily a size difference. So you can see Carmel here, she's still young. She has quite a ways that she could grow still. Adult females often reach more than three, sometimes up to four feet or more, once they're full grown, fully sized. But the males, and we'll get Hobbs out in a little bit here, are much smaller. They'll only get up to between two and two and a half feet on average. So uh, a little more than half the length of the females, but less than a third of the weight overall of these guys. So once they start growing, uh, once they hatch out and start growing, the females will tend to grow much faster than the males will. And they can reach maturity sometimes within six to eight months if they have a really, really good food source. The males, they tend to grow a little slower and in captivity, sometimes they can be a little pickier when it comes to feeding. Though overall, these guys tend to make really good pets because most of them have an extremely voracious appetite. Carmel here certainly does. She never misses a meal. Doesn't matter if she's in shed, which she's actually in right now, and you can tell that because she's got more uh, doled out colors. She's got the blue over her eyes. So she's getting ready to put on a new skin soon, but even then, uh, she doesn't care. She'll still eat. She'll still run around and roam. She's very curious. She comes out of her tub when I open it to find out what's going on. So we'll put her back real quick and we'll pull out the male to show by comparison. 
So this is Hobbs, this is the male, and as you can see right off the bat, he is a much smaller animal than Carmel is, but he's already an adult. Not quite full grown still, he could get a little bigger, but he's not growing very fast at this point, because he doesn't have much further to go. So they stay much smaller than the females, and this is in some ways a, uh, an adaptation to help the males, for one, move a lot faster, cover lots of ground to be able to find the females, as well as uh, the females, they get bigger in order to be able to support uh, larger eggs, therefore healthier offspring. Now Hobbs, he is your standard wild type Cape House snake. He's a little bit on the red side of the spectrum. They can range from kind of tannish or very deep browns with that general spotted pattern that you can see near his head, which fades towards almost a solid or sometimes lined appearance towards the back. That's your standard uh, appearance for the Cape House snakes. And they range, again, from very dark brown to uh, there's some localities that are actually famous for having extremely bright brick red colors. This guy's not quite that red, but he's got quite a bit of red in him. And they have an extremely iridescent appearance to their scales. They're very shiny. And while I'm not sure if this light shows it very well, Hobbs actually has just shed in the last uh, 24 hours or so, so he's got a perfectly new skin. About as uh, iridescent and shiny as he's going to get, and it shows really well, particularly in natural light. Now, Carmel, she's what is referred to as a T-positive amelanistic house snake, which means she lacks the brown or black pigments that allow him to be darker, melanin, but she has a tyrosinase enzyme that is still functional, hence the T in that name, T positive, that starts the process in melanin production, but doesn't quite finish the job. So she doesn't get very dark, but she retains this kind of caramel, yellowy, orange color. Now in house snakes, they have several different genetic mutations that are known right now, and the two, two of the most common are the T positives, and the T negative amelanistics. The T positives, of course, they get that caramel color. T negative amelanistics get a more lighter, kind of bright orange or very buttery yellowish color because the tyrosinase enzyme in them does not work at all, and so the process for producing melanin doesn't even work. Now, these guys are often referred to as albinos, which is incorrect because they still produce. Uh, colored pigments. Albino is generally a term that was first designed for mammals, which tend to have only one particular color pigment that makes up the various shades, and that's melanin. So having albinos occurs a lot easier in them. In snakes and other reptiles, though, they often have multiple color pigments. In the case of these guys, you have uh, the melanin, but you also have xanthins, which produce yellow, and possibly erythrins, which produce some of the red colors. And so in order for them to actually turn albino, you have to have mutations that wipe out all of those colors. Otherwise, there are very special names for the different uh, mutations that you see. Amelanism, azanthism, anerythrism. A lot of these names are common, it's commonly seen in other species like corn snakes and such. That's not the only mutations these guys have either. There are uh, hypomelanistic, reduced melanin animals and several different versions of that. There's regular, there's blue-eyed, uh, and several others. A lot of line-bred groups to get different colors, like the KwaZulu Natal reds. Now these guys make great pets because, as you can see, they're very laid-back animals. They're very docile, they're very curious, especially as they get bigger and they're no longer so small that everything scares them. So. When housing these guys, and this goes for just about any snake, your general estimation is you want a tank that is at least two-thirds to as long as the animal is, because you want them to be able to actually stretch out and be able to move around in their habitat, not be constricted too much, because while snakes do tend to sit in one place a lot of the time and hide. That's what their hide boxes are for, so that's something else that you should have in their tank, at least one or two, maybe even more, uh, hide boxes or logs or shells or something that they can hide under. One on the cool end of the tub, 
and one on the warm end so that they can choose between the two and thermoregulate properly. Uh, house snakes, they're not terribly picky generally when it comes to temperatures. They need a warm side, of course, somewhere in the mid 80s for proper thermoregulation, and then a cooler side that can be in the uh, high to low 70s. Too warm can sometimes make some of them uh, stop eating altogether, and way too warm, of course, can be uh, life-threatening to any snake, so you want to try and avoid that. Use a heat lamp or a heat pad, and preferably on a thermostat, so you can actually control uh, the temperatures that they are experiencing so that they have a proper gradient and you're not keeping them too cold or too hot. These guys come from a relatively dry area in sub-Saharan Africa, or at least some places in their habitat can be, so they're not too terribly picky about humidity, but when it comes to shed time, uh, it is good to have uh, some heightened humidity or have a uh, shed box in there that has some moist substrate for them to burrow themselves into. Mine, I have a shed box in there all the time because sometimes they just like to hang out in the moisture spots. So, and I'll find them oftentimes just lounging about in there rather than in one of their other hides. And so that allows them to also pick between uh, the moist areas and drier depending on how they're feeling. Uh, that allows them to kind of regulate both temperature and humidity as they need. Always keep a uh, properly filled water dish in there, uh, preferably one that's strong enough, heavy enough that they won't knock it over as they're traveling around in their habitat. And the substrate, generally they're not too picky. With snakes in general you want to avoid things like uh, cedar and other pines which can actually produce toxic uh, compounds for these reptiles, but compounds like aspen or uh, cocoa bedding Cocoa, if you keep it, uh, it can be kept on the moist side, but again, these guys, they are not unaccustomed to fairly dry habitat, so you can keep it fairly dry as well. Uh, shredded newspaper or other papers, so long as it doesn't have any toxic prints on them, works pretty well. And then, generally, uh, you should never be sold an animal that isn't already feeding very well, but... With these guys, usually that's not a problem. Most of them will eat fairly regularly, and most of them are pretty easy to uh, get eating on mice that are, and sometimes small rats that are easily acquired at most pet stores. And so Hobbs here, he's a little bit more finicky about feeding than Carmel is. Oftentimes I just have to leave the mouse in with him in order to get him to eat, and he'll take it overnight. Carmel, on the other hand, she'll come straight out of the tub after the food and she'll actually grab and constrict it because these guys are non-venomous. They have no venom. Even though they're related to lapids, they have no fangs. So they actually kill their prey via constriction, a lot like uh, a lot of colubrids or pythons. And so, fairly easy to feed. And also, for those who are interested in that sort of thing, they're also very easy to breed. With these guys being found across tropical and subtropical regions, they don't really have any particular uh, seasonal cues that they have to follow, so they will breed literally all year long. And with these guys, sometimes you put a male with a female, that's all it takes, and they'll even breed every couple of months sometimes. Not necessarily the healthiest for the female, because you want to make sure they keep up a good weight for breeding, but Generally, all that's needed in order to get babies from these guys are a male and a female. At adulthood, you put them in the tank and you wait. And that's all it takes. These guys were busy uh, when they were breeding. They stayed locked all night long, a good 14, 16 hours that they were locked together. So their breeding processes can sometimes take quite a while. And once they're bred once, uh, the females will often, they'll lay one clutch of eggs and then sometimes not have to breed again but still retain sperm to produce fertile clutches two or three times afterwards. So the, uh, these guys about two and a half, three months ago, they bred and then Carmel laid her first clutch of six eggs and then about two months later she laid a second clutch without ever having been paired with Hobbs again and all of those eggs fertile as well. Now, 
as time goes on, she'll reduce the amount of retained sperm that she'll have until eventually she can't produce any more fertile eggs, at which point in order to produce more she would have to be paired up again. But to keep these guys healthy, often it's recommended only pair them once, maybe twice a year, and at other times just focus on keeping the females uh, well fed at a proper weight so that they don't get stressed out and uh, die early. So we'll put this guy back and in a moment here we'll get out uh, one of the babies to show you just how small these guys start out as. So not too long ago we actually had a clutch that hatched out and this is the uh, last of the males that happened to hatch out. Uh, Carmel laid six beautiful eggs and they took about two months to incubate and over that period of time you can actually watch as the eggs actually expand uh, absorbing water as the babies inside grow and use up the nutrients. So you can see they start out very very small, nowhere near the size of the adults. But even at this age they can still manage to take on pinky mice, uh, small lizards, uh, other small mammals, and these guys are actually, they've already all started to uh, get feeding all but one and so now that they're starting to eat regularly they can start to be prepared for heading off to new homes. And you can see even as babies they're very curious animals they're fairly laid back of course they're a little skittish at this size because literally everything is bigger than them and so everything in the wild eats them but when they realize that they're in no danger they no longer try and make a run for it once you got them in your hands. They just want to explore. They just want to look around. And even when young they already have the strong patterns that can be seen in the adults and as this guy gets older his color will actually probably lighten up a little bit more to match that of Hobbes. He'll probably be a little darker since Carmel seems to have a lot of dark background in her going off of what some of the others look like. One female in particular is extremely dark brown right now, so she has a very high contrast pattern. So these guys will take about six to eight months minimum to reach adulthood, preferably not being used for breeding if they end up for that purpose for at least a year, 18 months or more. You want these guys, though they can breed at a very young age, that is often rather detrimental to their health. So you, it's best if you get them uh, up to a very good, a very proper size. Uh, females should be at least somewhere around three feet long or so, and at least a couple hundred grams before they start being used for breeding. Otherwise, that can dramatically shorten their lifespan. And one of the things that a lot of people really like about these African house snakes is unlike a lot of other common pet snakes they actually they're very nocturnal animals so they actually have those classic elliptical pupils that a lot of people wrongly associate just with uh, just with venomous snakes now unfortunately the camera here isn't wanting to focus too well on it but hopefully somewhere in this you'll be able to catch uh, glimpses of those eyes. He's got vertical elliptical pupils and at night of course when there's very little light those pupils will actually open wide to your more standard uh, round shape to let in as much light as possible so they can actually uh, find food in the dark. So that's about all that I have to cover for the house snakes. Uh, if you guys have any questions feel free to leave a comment down below or uh, send a message through my website carltoncarnivores.com uh, again these guys make great pets if you're prepared to take care if you're prepared to take care of an animal these guys can be very very rewarding pets they live for about 10 years, 7 to 10 years is often an average sometimes a little longer so they're not as long lived as say a corn snake or a uh, ball python, for example. So, again, any questions that you have, uh, anything that I didn't cover that you'd like to know more about, feel free to leave a comment below or visit uh, the website at carltoncarnivores.com. And thanks for watching.